Well, good morning, and we'd like to welcome those that are joining us on our live stream with Facebook this morning as well. As we continue on our journey through the Bible, today we come to Micah. And to introduce us to this prophet, we'll be reading from uh, chapter 6, and we'll read verse 8. The passage, perhaps, that uh, many of us are familiar with. He has showed you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you just asking that your Holy Spirit will guide and direct us in our time together. I acknowledge, Lord, that I cannot teach this in the flesh. I ask the anointing power of your Holy Spirit. I ask that you will give me the words that you would have to be shared. Lord, I pray for each one that is listening. And I ask that your Holy Spirit will speak to our hearts. Lord, may you illuminate our minds. Give us direction in our life. Lord, we want to hear from you, and we pray that we will not shut our ears to what it is you would have us to hear. And so we yield ourselves up before you. It's in that precious name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. The names in the Bible are often significant. And the key to understanding the book of Micah can be found in the meaning of his name. His name actually is an abbreviated form of the Hebrew name Micaiah, and it means who is like the Lord. And it doesn't take long when you begin reading his book to find out that is the theme, Godlikeness. Who is like the Lord? And Micah makes it clear. It is certainly not the people of God. It is obvious that they have neglected their relationship with the Lord. And so Micah comes on the scene calling them to come back into a right relationship with with their God. Now, Micah is also a contemporary of Hosea and Amos in the northern kingdom of Israel, and with Isaiah in the southern kingdom. And in fact, when you read the book of Micah, it's like reading a condensed version of Isaiah. Much of what he has to say is similar to Isaiah himself. As already noted, only he says it a lot quicker. It's a much smaller, shorter book. And the book of Micah contains three messages that he received from the Lord. And the first message is a warning. God's judgment is coming. When I was going to title the sermon, I started to title it that, God's Judgment is Coming. And I've learned that on Facebook, the title that you put on it has a lot to do with even if people watch it for three seconds or not. And I got a feeling you put God's Judgment is Coming, and you've already tuned out most people. We don't want to hear that kind of message. And his message is directed to both the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. They have failed to keep their covenant with God. And so Micah doesn't beat around the bush. He has a very short introduction and then he moves right into his message and he sounds the alarm. God's judgment's coming, and it's because God's people have failed to be God-like. And this first message resembles that of a court scene. 
As I read it, I can almost just envision it looking like a court uh, scene that's taking place before us. And so it all begins when the court is convened. You can almost see the bailiff entering and he proclaims, Hear, O people, all of you listen, O earth, and all who are in it, that the sovereign Lord may witness against you the Lord from his holy temple. And so God is the judge. As we continue reading, we discover that Judah and Samaria are the defendants. And yet, as we just read, the whole earth has been summoned before him. And that's to remind us that we're no less accountable than his chosen people, than the people of Israel. And if God is going to judge his chosen people, he will judge the whole earth. And then the judge enters. But no human judge has ever entered like this. Instead of the bailiff calling out, all rise, he says, look, the Lord is coming from his dwelling place. He comes down and dwell. He comes down and treads on the high places of the earth. The mountains melt before him and the valleys split apart like wax before the fire, like water rushing down a slope. And I seriously doubt that we just sit there. And while the text doesn't say it, Paul does tell us that we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me and every tongue will confess God. And so when God's court is convened, we will all rise. We will stand before him and then we will bow before his presence. And the judge is the omnipotent one, the all-powerful, and he is the one who has come to carry out justice on the earth. You know, power has everything to do with justice, doesn't it? You can't carry out justice if you're powerless. And so it's extremely important to realize that he is the one who is all-powerful. And so when he comes to carry out justice, justice will be done. And his court will not be like any court here on earth because the judge is also omniscient. He's all-knowing. And because he knows all things, there will be no need for any evidence to be presented. There'll be no need for witnesses. There's nothing that will need to be added. And there will be no defense. He knows everything about us. And when we look at our own life, we know that it will be indefensible. And so the judge in this court scene calls the defendants. And it will be that northern kingdom of Israel and he addresses them as Samaria and the southern kingdom of Judah. The Lord has come to judge his chosen people. Peter writes and he says, for it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. See, it's that reminder, just as God's judgment begins with the chosen people of God, that judgment will continue to us as well. In fact, that's why the Apostle Paul encourages us to examine ourselves. He says, but if we judged ourselves, 
we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. Did you get that? That when the Lord comes and he judges us as his people, we're not being judged to be condemned, but to be disciplined. And there's a world of difference between those two things. When the world is judged, the world will be condemned. And when God judges us, it's because he loves us and he wants to discipline us. As he says in Hebrews, the Lord disciplines those he loves. Now, he also reminds us there that no discipline is pleasant at the time. But then when he brings that discipline into our life, it's to get us back on track. And isn't that why a loving parent disciplines their children? It's to get them back onto the right track. No loving parent is going to watch their child start going astray and do absolutely nothing about it. If you do nothing, it means you don't care. And God cares deeply. He loves us. And so he brings his discipline into our lives. And God loves the chosen people. And so he brings discipline into their life. And then the judgment is announced. Samaria will be a heap of ruins. And Judah will be conquered and go into exile. And the tragedy is that it didn't have to happen. If they had simply responded to God's discipline to begin with. It's all the result of their stubborn rebellion and their refusal to repent. And sometimes we're no different. God brings his discipline into our life. He's getting our attention, wanting to get us back on the right track. And if we continue to ignore him. We bring that discipline upon ourselves. In fact, that's generally what discipline is, isn't it? It's something we brought on ourselves. Every time my parents disciplined me, it was my fault. I was responsible. And when God brings discipline into our lives, it's because we're the ones that are at fault. And the purpose is to bring that repentance into our life. Now, there is something interesting that takes place in the book of Micah. He uses a play on words. But we have a problem. The play on words takes place in Hebrew. And we're generally reading an English translation. And you can't just bring that translation into play in this. But let me just give you a couple of examples that you find right away here with this in chapter 1. He says, Tell it not in Gath. And the word Gath sounds like tell. And so if you were to hear him in Hebrew, it would sound something like this, translating it. Tell it not in tell. That little play and it goes on and he says, In Beth Orpha roll in the dust. Well, Beth means, or by Yeth means house, Orpha means dust. And so he's saying, In the house of dust, roll in the dust. And then he says, Pass on in nakedness and shame, you who live in Shafir. And Shafir means pleasant. And there's going to be nothing pleasant about being carried into captivity, naked and disgraced. He says, Sa'ana will not come out. And Sa'ana means come out. And so come out will not come out. And as he continues, though, he presents this picture of utter destruction. Destruction. 
And he says that it's coming specifically for two sins. And this is where it really comes home. Because the sins that he mentions are very much a part of the fabric of our society today. The first thing that he talks about is their covetousness. And covetousness is wanting something you don't have because someone else has it. I think you could define materialism that way, couldn't you? We live in an age of materialism, and so materialism is going to find its very roots in that sin of covetousness. And we see it in our own lives. It's when we have to have the newest and the best. It's not good enough to have an iPhone 11. We need a 13. Why? Because it just came out. It has to be better than the old one was. And so we do that in so many areas of our life. We just got to have the next best thing. And it may not be because someone else has it. It's because we want them to know that we have it. But not only does he mention their covetousness, but he says they're listening to false prophets. And the Apostle Paul warns us when he says, the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. You can always find a preacher that will tell you what you want to hear. And we're living in an age where people are looking for exactly that. They're looking for someone who's going to be politically correct. And many times they're looking for someone who's just going to be political rather than presenting the message of God and His Word into our lives. And so it makes the words of Micah ring out loud and clear when he says, If a liar and a deceiver comes and says, I will prophesy for you plenty of wine and beer, He would be just the prophet for this people. So that's what false prophets do. They lie and deceive and they tell people what they want to hear. And we're living in an age of deception. It may be we're not that much different than the people that Micah came presenting his message to. And so for the people of Israel, the judgment will come. And it will come in two phases. In 721 B.C., the Assyrians will come swooping into the northern kingdom of Israel. And they will destroy it and carry off the inhabitants into captivity. And then in 586 B.C., The Babylonians will defeat the southern kingdom of Judah. Now it's interesting, why the time difference? And after Micah's preaching and during his time, there was a brief revival that broke out in the southern kingdom. We can actually say they were beginning to listen to what he had to say. But revivals don't continue. Revivals come to an end. It didn't last. And so in 586, the Babylonians come in and they destroy Jerusalem and the temple and the people are carried off into exile. And then we come to the second message. And it is a contrast between Israel's ruler and the ruler to come. The promised Messiah. The difference between the rulers that they have and the ruler that we are looking for. And so Micah opens his message to the rulers in this. He says he's looking for godliness. 
And he's been looking in the southern kingdom. And as he looks at the leadership, he doesn't find it. That will preach today, won't it? I've been looking at the leaders in this country. And I've been looking for godliness. And I'm just not finding it. But he goes even deeper than that. He says there's nothing godly about the rulers. And there's no godliness in the prophets. It's not just in the political leaders. It's also in the leaders within the church. And then he says there's nothing godlike even with the priest. Instead of godliness, he's finding corruption, oppression, and bribery and injustice. And he sums up the whole lot of leadership saying, her leaders judge for a bribe, her priests teach for a price, and her prophets tell fortunes for money. And God will hold them accountable. He says in chapter 312, Zion will be plowed like a field. Jerusalem will become a heap of rubble. The temple hill, a mound overgrown with thickets. And so in contrast to the leadership within Israel, we find the ruler who is to come. The promised one. The Messiah. And so Micah looks into the distant future to a time that he calls the last days. He looks beyond our time period and he sees the rule of the promised one. And here's what he writes. In the last days, the mountains of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between many peoples, and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations will not take up sword against nations, nor will they train for war anymore. He's describing that beautiful time when the Messiah will rule. And it will be a time of righteousness and justice and peace. But then he presents another contrast. And it's a contrast between the Babylonian conquest and a future conquest. He says, for now, you must leave the city. You will go to Babylon. Remember, this isn't just a sightseeing tour. The reason they're going to Babylon is they're being carried off in captivity. But then he says, you will return. And in the distant future, nations will once again come out against you. But they will not realize that the Lord has gathered them like sheaves to the threshing floor. He's looking from beyond the time of the Babylonian captivity to the restoration of Israel to a time even in our future when armies will surround them once again. But this time they've been summoned by the Lord. And the battle that he's speaking of is the one found in Revelation chapter 16, verse 16, when it says, Then they gathered the kings together in the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. We've talked about, you won't read the phrase the battle of Armageddon, but that's what's going to be described when the nations have been gathered against the people of God and God comes to their rescue. And then he continues. Continues. 
And the scene changes and he presents another contrast. And this time the contrast is between the ruler of Babylon and the ruler who will come out of Bethlehem. And the ruler out of Babylon, he says, will strike the ruler of Israel's cheek. And it's a reference to when the Babylonians come in. We might call it a little bit more than a strike on the cheek. Because the Babylonians took the king of Israel. They brought his family before them and they killed them. And then they gouged out his eyes so that the last thing that he would see would be the death of his family. The last memory he has. And he contrasts that with the ruler who comes out of Bethlehem. We read in chapter 5 verse 2. But you Bethlehem, Ephratah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come one for me who will be the ruler over Israel whose origins are from old, now hang on to that, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Now you're probably familiar with that passage. If you remember when the wise men come looking for the one who has been born king of the Jews, and they go to Jerusalem because they're looking for a king, and where do you look for a king? You go to the capital. They go to the palace and they ask, where's the one who's been born king of the Jews? And this is news for Herod. And so he inquires what they're talking about. And who does he send for? The chief priest. And he asks them, where's the one who's to be born king of the Jews to be born? And they tell him, Bethlehem. How did they know the answer? It's because it was right here in Micah. It told them exactly where the Messiah was to be born. And he tells us something else about the Messiah here. He gives us this description of him. And he says that he, his origins are of old, from ancient times. When we celebrate Christmas and we call it the birth of Jesus, what we're really celebrating is not the fact that he was born, it's the fact of the incarnation. Jesus existed long before he was born in Bethlehem. His origins are from old, from ancient times. Because Jesus is God. And in Bethlehem, it's when he takes on human flesh. So Micah sees into the future 700 years before Christ was born. And he saw his birthplace and he saw what his character and his true nature would be like. That it would be the very nature of God. And so we began learning the answer to the question, who is like God? And the only truly godly person to ever walk on the face of this earth was the Messiah who was born in Bethlehem, Jesus. And then we come to his third message. And the third message has two appeals to a nation asking them to repent and return to God. And in his first appeal, Michael, Micah sets it up by setting the stage with this. And he says, listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, O mountains, the Lord's accusations. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth, for the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. And then the Lord speaks. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. And then he reminds them of their history of redemption. I brought you out of Egypt. I redeemed you from slavery. I sent Moses and Aaron and Miriam to lead you. I led you in the wilderness. You know the redemptive history. You know all of my righteous acts. And so then we find the people's response. 
and they ask a question. It sounds like they're serious. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted one? But then as you continue reading, they ask, shall we offer calves? A thousand rams? 10,000 rivers of oil? My firstborn? It's like, God, what do you want from me? Oh, have you ever asked that question? It's like God's asking too much. It's when you look back at his question and he says, My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? And somehow it seems that worshiping God is a burden. And then they even ask, should I offer my firstborn? You don't find the answer here, but I think it's given to us. No, I'll take care of that. Because God's the one who offered his firstborn. Where Jesus Christ was given up for our sins. And here's God's answer to them, though. He has showed you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. He's not looking for religion. You see, when they ask their questions, it's like, what do we have to do to be religious enough? What are we supposed to be offering you? Calves, bulls, rams, thousands, ten thousand, rivers of oil? You see, God's not looking for a religion. He's looking for a relationship. And it's found in those words to walk humbly with your God. It reminds us of the image that we saw right in the beginning at the creation when God would come and walk in the cool of the evening with Adam and Eve. It's a relationship that God wants. It's not a religion. And so the way to godliness is to walk humbly with your God. And it's when we've done that that we can act justly and love mercy. There's nothing within us that naturally wants to bring justice and mercy. And then we find his second appeal. And once again, Micah sets the stage. Listen. The Lord is calling to the city, and to fear your name is wisdom. And then the Lord says, Heed the rod and the one who appointed it. It's the rod of discipline. I've disciplined you, and you have not listened. Now, my mother described that as having a hard head makes a sore tail. I guess you figured out she believed in corporal punishment. Well, in essence, that's what God has said to his people. Heed the rod and the one who appointed it. I've disciplined you. I've tried to get your attention. I've tried to get you back onto the right path, and you still will not repent. Do you expect me just to overlook your sin? Do you expect me to just forget your wickedness? And if that's what you're looking for, it's not going to happen. Because God is just. And justice demands that crimes be paid for. And so he can't just overlook it. And then the Lord says, Her rich men are violent, her people are liars, and their tongues speak deceitfully. Therefore, I have begun to destroy you, to ruin you because of your sins. And then he concludes saying, I will give you over to ruin. Do you know that's how Paul described the wrath of God? If you read Romans chapter 1, three times you find it that he says, and God gave them over 
I'll give you over to ruin, he says to his chosen people. And when God says, I will give you over, it's I'm giving you over to the natural consequences of your sin. But the book doesn't close with that. It closes with the reality that the Lord is merciful. He doesn't bring judgment for condemnation. He wants us to turn to him. He wants us to experience forgiveness. He wants us to experience restoration. He wants us to be in a relationship with him. He wants us experiencing a life in him, a life of fellowship. And so he says, who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives? All he says is, come to me. It's exactly why Jesus Christ came. So that we could have forgiveness of sin. So that we can have life with him. So that we can be growing in our relationship with him. Why? Because that's what God wants. He wants a relationship with us. He wants an intimate relationship with us. And when we choose to walk humbly with our God, when we choose to grow in that personal relationship, it's then that he can shape us and mold us into people who are God-like, people who act justly and show mercy. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for the prophet Micah. And so much of what he says seems relevant for our lives today. And Lord, if we've rebelled against you, we ask that your Holy Spirit will speak to our hearts. We invite you to bring that conviction into our life. Bring us back into that right relationship with you. And it's in that precious name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand.